Thank you. Cool. 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 Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present George Wolf. Hi, so let me just start by saying that uh, I'm really grateful and privileged to be speaking here at Camp JS, especially having sat through the talks that we've seen over the last day or two, and um, really humbled to be presenting here. And uh, it's a great honor, it really is. So I'm gonna be talking about building scalable and maintainable microservices. How many people here are working in like a microservices architecture at the moment, just so I can get an idea? Okay, and how many people are coding uh, those microservices in Node? Okay, great. So I'm Josh Wolf. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Kamunda these days. And uh, that's a picture of me at the Queensland State Championships for like a classic physique competition that I competed in last year kind of was a total nerd in school, and uh, this is my, my chance to have my go at being a, a weightlifting programmer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so why microservices? Some people are already doing it, some people are not. Uh, have you guys heard of Conway's Law before? Conway's Law is that uh, a system will have the same architecture as the team or teams that build that system. And as we're building bigger and more complex distributed systems, we have more teams working on it. And the kind of classical example of Conway's law is, if you have three teams working on building a compiler, you're gonna end up with a three-pass compiler, because you've got three teams. So microservices are great at like isolating functionality and having different teams moving at different speeds. They can use their own languages, they can you know, build things in isolation and then connect them together. Uh, and so a, a big part of of microservices and a lot of what we've been hearing about this weekend is about separation of concerns. You know, even in Matt's demo that he just gave, he just reminds me, have you guys heard of Jaron Lanier? Anyone remember him? He was like this VR visionary pioneer from the 90s. And uh, the first time I saw Matt, actually, he was the first person in Brisbane that I knew of who used GraphQL a few years ago. He's like really in the future. But in that demo that he just showed, you know, he had that idea of state flowing into those blocks. And you know, we had Inga talking about React, and that's like a principle of that, is you have state separated from the actual logic of the program. So the separation of state and logic is an important one, because you can test your logic independent of the mutations of the state. Um, there's two types of state as well. There's like, if you think about going into the 7-Eleven and you're buying a coffee, in, in the 7-Eleven they've got like, their cash register, they got the coffee machine, they always have to keep going and refilling it with coffee and milk. So there's like the level of the coffee and the milk that's in the machine, there's the amount of money that they have in their cash register, and then if I go in there and buy a coffee, I pour the coffee into my cup, now the, you know, the global state, if you will, of their inventory has gone down, the cash register is in whatever state it is, but there's this kind of transactional state, which is me with my coffee cup, I owe them a dollar for the coffee and I gotta pay for that. And that's a kind of a, a different type of state from the, from the global inventory. So that the tra if you have like a petrol station and you've got a thousand liters of petrol there, you only need to store one number, which is a thousand, but you could potentially have a thousand customers come in, put one liter of petrol into each of their cars or containers, now you've got a thousand transactions that you have to track. So you probably would not want to put that, that in the same table as the total amount of petrol. One of them is a thousand rows, the other one is a single row. So you want to separate your system state and your transactional state. Uh, and then another separation of concerns is between orchestration and implementation. So, you know, if you have microservices, they all have to coordinate with each other and they have to work somehow. Where are you going to put the, the, the orchestration of that? And that kind of um, leaks into this idea of choreography or orchestration. So if you have microservices, individual teams building different parts of the system, where does the coordination of all of those parts live? So you could put a, a little bit of coordination into each part so that each of your microservices understands what the other microservices are and how they all coordinate together. But then what you've got now, you might have isolated your state and your logic, but the coordination of your overall system is now mixed in with the implementation of the system still. So as we get more and more complex problems that we have to solve, we have to solve different classes of problems. So this is, I see this as being one of the next big problems that we have to face is how do we isolate orchestration of microservices from the microservices themselves? And 
the solution that I have come across in the last kind of year or two that I think is, is the future is business process modeling notation. So I'll give you a kind of a demo of that, what that looks like. How do I get out of here? Exit. So this is um, the ZB modeler. So at Komunda, uh, it's a company in Germany. It's been going for like uh, seven or eight years and building a workflow management engine using BPMN, it's an ISO standard. And the way we discovered this is we had to design our system that we were building at Credit Sense for microservices and we were diagramming them out and we found this graphical kind of designer. You know, when Calvin was, you were talking yesterday about using Node-RED and it came up a couple of times, the great benefit of that is that you can have developers and BAs working on the same page. So this is the, the graphical designer, this is a start event and then I can connect it to this. I'm gonna build like the, the to-do app of microservices. So, you know, the to-do list that you build when any framework for microservices or orchestration, the to-do app is the e-commerce flow. You know, it's a, a business transaction that takes place through time and it's someone ordering something on your website, you check your inventory, so that'll be the first step. So this here is the start and it's a customer order. This is purchase fulfillment, so customer order that triggers the, the, the start of the whole process flow. And then you want to check your inventory to see whether you can service the, you know, do we have this thing in stock or not? And then the next thing you probably want to do is like um, process their payment. Payment. And then the next thing that you want to do is um, ship the item to them. And then end. So here's like a, a kind of a, you sketch out the idea of this, right? And, and with this modeling, you can build like kind of flow charts. And we started out by designing our system and we we're building all these designs and it was we were a couple of months into it. We went back and looked at the first designs that we'd done and they were already out of date. And then we s discovered that we could actually make the BPMN diagrams themselves executable. So we didn't have to have like documentation and then build the thing. The documentation is part of the actual system itself because BPMN is executable. So I'm going to show you that. So in the designer, what you can do is you go into the properties and you give this task here a type. So that's a, a check inventory type. It's probably pretty small to see that, but I'm typing check inventory in here. And I'll tell it to have three retries. Do the same thing for process payment and the same thing for ship items. And then you've got like a basic kind of flow here and you can connect your microservices to this and then it can be executed. You can start the workflow and then all of the state of the transaction is maintained in the workflow engine itself. And then the microservices subscribe to those different tasks as topics and then do whatever side effects you need to do. So check inventory would go and check that table to see do we have the sufficient inventory to service it. Process payment would go out to Stripe or wherever it goes to, do the processing of the payment. And then the shipping item can go to like Tanda or something to you know, ship the thing out. So here's um, a more complex one. This is the one that I'm actually gonna show you running. So in here there's like some conditional kind of logic which is what you'd expect, right? If the, if the item is not in stock, then we're gonna branch out and we're just gonna exit the whole process. If we can't charge their credit card, we're gonna branch out. And then if we can't ship the item to them, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna raise an incident and we'll decrement the stock and we'll publish the outcome to the consumer. So I'm gonna show, show you this whole thing running in, in a workflow engine. And the workflow engine that I'm gonna show you it running in is an engine called ZB. And so Komunda built a, a classic kind of 90s uh, workflow management engine. Has anybody used a workflow management engine here? Yeah, you have. Which one have you used? I can't remember the name. We took it on um, our company Okay. You put the code in the engine, yeah. So that was the kind of classical 90s idea is like it was like a one-stop shop and they were pitching it with this idea of like zero code. You can get rid of your developers and then people can just design these flows and it will just run and it's like magic. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zero code solutions. You, you usually end up writing like all this stuff for, for exceptions and, 
and um, exceptional cases. And the other problem with those classical uh, workflow engines is that they use a database to store the state, so they can't scale. So um, what we did with ZB is we looked at distributed systems like Kafka and other systems and, and changed from using a database to using an immutable stream and using event sourcing. You know, you might not understand if you haven't been exposed to many of these ideas, a lot of what I'm talking about, but just let it wash over you and you know, later on you'll hear it pop up somewhere else and you'll be like, oh, I remember that talk at CampJS. So it uses immutable streams and it uses sharding and replication. So this is a kind of an architect, a architecture diagram of the thing. So you have a cluster of these brokers and they, they replicate the data between them. It's sharded, it's replicated, so it's fault tolerant, it's load, ba load balancing, and it uses gRPC on the front end, which is like Google's protocol for binary communication. Uh, apparently, most of the traffic on the internet is REST, except for Netflix streaming, which I think is UDP. But then um, inside data centers, like intra-data center traffic, the majority of it is gRPC because it's a, a lightweight binary protocol. And uh, it exports data into a data lake, which usually is Elasticsearch. And you can have clients that connect to it that can be written in any language, Java, Go, Ruby, C Sharp. So when I first encountered this, we started um, doing proof of concepts on it at CreditSense, and there was no JavaScript client. So we used Go to do the proof of concept. And it worked, and we thought it was good. We're going to use it. So I went back to my team. I thought, great, this is my opportunity to use Go. I'm like, guys, good news. We're going to be programming in Go. And there's like five other, five other devs on the team. And they're like, ah, yeah, no, we're not. We're sticking to JavaScript. So I took the opportunity to write the, the JavaScript client for it. And I wrote it in TypeScript. And there was no existing client for it, and it became like the JavaScript client for it that like everybody uses now. And I wrote it in TypeScript, and Rob gave his talk about TypeScript yesterday. One of the things um, that's um, like really amazing about TypeScript is that you actually get documentation for free when you write your code in TypeScript, and I'll show you what that looks like. So with just with a single npm command out of the the library, it can produce this kind of documentation. So on the left-hand side, is the that's the readme file out of the project. And then here's all the API documentation over here. It's auto-generated, so it's always up to date with the actual state of the code itself. And here are all the classes, all of the, the different kind of API calls and things that they can do, auto-generated. Like it's real important to have documentation, and if you can have automatically generated documentation like this out of TypeScript, or if you can have executable documentation like the BPMN, then you never have to worry about them drifting out of date. So I'm going to show you um, this thing running because I'll give you a demo so you can get a sense of it. So I'm, I'm running the, the ZB broker in Docker in the background. And then I'm running this visualization tool over the top of it called Operate, which looks into the Elasticsearch export and gives me a live visualization of my microservices architecture. And I'm going to run this um, little thing here, the, this e-commerce flow. So I've built the code for it, and I'll show you what it looks like. Oh, so the way I've got this running is I've got a REST, an Express REST server running, and I've got my little ZB web, web shop e-commerce store which is this thing here. So I wanted to have it linked up so that I could actually like click on the stuff in the store and do it, but it, it's, uh, I think it works a little bit better. I've got a REST, a REST emulator that I'm going to show you. So there's two things that we're selling in the, in the store here. One of them is the ZB open source contributor pack. It's got a ZB t-shirt and a copy of this book called Real Life BPMN. Uh, that one there, you can't buy it, actually. We send it out to people who contribute to the project, so we've sent it to a bunch of people around the world. That's the only way you can get it. This is hypothetical, though, so we're imagining that you could buy it. And the other one is the Kamunda Escalation Ale. It's an IPA. So I went to the Kamunda World Headquarters in Berlin in July, and uh, they have a microbrewery in the office, and they make this beer there, and they share it with customers and um, clients. So you can't buy that either. <laughs> so this is a completely hypothetical example. We're imagining that you could buy the ZB open source contributor pack and you could buy the ale. 
So that's the, the e-commerce store. Then my REST server is the, the back-end REST API for this. So I make my, I post to the REST server, say, you know, this customer wants to buy this object. Here's the code for the REST server. Simple. Uh, it is pretty simple in here. So it's just got start a REST server. It's got a single endpoint API purchase. It's got a function here to deploy that BPM uh, diagram into the server. And it has a single microservice worker that it runs in here which collects the outcome of the workflow and then pushes it back inside the REST, uh, you know, the REST resp request response context so that I can now publish back the result to the, to the customer. So if I go to my other window, Okay, so I'll start my REST server here. So you can see it deployed my workflow into the engine. It's listening on port 3000. Now I'm going to, I'm going to order one of those ZB open source contributor packs. And this just posts a, a request to the REST server. It's asking for the ZB open source contributor pack. I've passed in a valid payment method and it's got, it uses the NPM module called random name, so it's sending it for art heverling. So you can see that in my REST server, I've got the order, and it's created a workflow, um, but it didn't get the response in time from the engine, so it's timed out. So what I made the REST server do is, if it times out because the broker is under load, or in this case, my microservices haven't started, it sends a callback URL to the customer with like, a, it's like a future, like a promise. And then the client can just keep polling the REST server and say, hey, have you got a result for this uh, transaction yet? So if I start my inventory worker here, it starts, it checks um, the inventory and, it, and we've got that one in stock. I'll show you what the code for that worker looks like. Uh, microservices, inventory, simple. The code is really simple. You just import the ZB node library and you just call create worker, give it an ID. This is the microservice type of task that it grabs onto. And then it takes a job and a complete function. And then the job has variables in it and that's where the product and the name are gonna show up. And then it just calls the complete function with either success or fa failure. And I kind of like, um, modeled this API on like a promise, resolve, reject kind of idea. So it has like a success and a failure. I'll start my payment microservice and my shipping microservice. So you can see the payment was successfully made for art. The shipping API has like a two second delay on it to simulate calling up to Tanda or some other API. So it went through the whole thing and then it, you can see that the REST response has come back to the polling client and said, okay, we shipped the thing to the person. So it's gone all the way through. And so I'll show you now if I try ordering the Escalation Ale. It's really popular and it's always out of stock. So it started the workflow. Um, you can see that the inventory worker, is there a pointer? No, okay. The inventory microservice, which is um, up the top here in yellow, says it's out of stock, and then it's just exited out of the process flow. It's done. So what I can do now is I can turn off my shipping service, and I'll start another shipping service I have, which fails the shipping every time. Run, no ship. And then I'm going to order the open, server, the open source contributor pack. And so the payment got successfully made. And then you can see in the white one, it says it was purchased but didn't ship. So there's some kind of failure in, in the microservices, you know, uh, in the, not in the microservices themselves, like all my code is running, but there's been a failure in the business process itself. And this is where you... You know, where do you, where do you deal with these kind of failures? Like whose responsibility is it if the thing doesn't ship? Is it the shipping uh, microservices responsibility or like which team is responsible for dealing or handling that error? 
And when you have like a microservices architecture, these are the kind of problems that you run into because if I'm in the team that builds the shipping microservice, I'm responsible for that, but if, if the, you know, and, and it failed, and then I'm gonna report some kind of state, but where is the team that's responsible for the overall business process? So this is Conway's law where the, the, the technology that you're using and the um, teams that you're using are kind of how do they map together, like whose responsibility is the whole business process? And if you, if you follow, um, I think his name is Sam Newman, He's the ThoughtWorks guy who talks about microservices, and he says, it was either him or Martin Fowler said, uh, you know, an anti-pattern in microservices development is to build like a god service, like the, the one big service that controls everything, because now you no longer have a microservice, you now have like a, um, a monolith again, but with small pieces that are disconnected. So what happens here is that if I go into operate, so this is the visualization kind of uh, component. Oh, I just want to give a shout out to Portainer. Is anybody here using Portainer? How many people here are using Docker uh, for their stuff? So Portainer is, um, it's a Docker container that runs and gives you a GUI for all of your Docker containers that are running on your machine. So you start it and then it just like registers all of the Docker containers. And it gives you a web GUI, you can log into it and then you can inspect all of the running containers. You can see their logs, you can run commands on them, restart them, mount volumes, do all that kind of stuff. So I'm running operate in a, in a container, and if I go into my dashboard, let's refresh this, log in. So you can see here it says that there's one running instance in total. Sorry? Zoom in, sure. How's that? Is that better? I've got to start my incident worker. And if I go back to the dashboard, refresh. Go back to the dashboard again. So. Here you can see that there's one running instance and it has an incident in it. So something has gone wrong in the business process. All of the microservices are working fine, but the business process itself has failed. Failed. It's in some kind of failure state. And so when I go in here, you can see my BPMN, you know, that's, that, that's the system diagram. And it was that design document that I made at the beginning. So in the design phase, the developers, the BAs, they're sitting there, they design and spec out the system. And then the developers go away and write the implementation of the microservices, you publish this thing into the engine, and now the actual design document is the actual executable system architecture. And this is it at runtime. And you can see that, that failure to ship. So basically what happened was we checked the inventory. Yep, we got the open source contributor pack in the, uh, you know, in, in the factory or the warehouse and we charged their credit card for it, great, now we're gonna ship it out, but something failed in the shipping API. So we've charged the customer, we haven't sent them the thing. So what we can do here is raise the visibility of that so that you, can, you could put this into a task list for someone, for example, and then they can come into work and go, hey, we got an order that didn't go out, I'm gonna ship it. They go into the warehouse, they take it out, they put it in a box, they put a label on it, and then they send it out manually. Now what they can do is they go into this failed instance, and you can see here's the state of the, of the business process from the engine. And then I can go in here and say, change that from false to true. Here. And then restart the instance. and it's now flowed through, it's decremented the stock in the, in the warehouse and it's gone through. So what you have here is that when your business process can be handled by the machines, the microservices, they do the thing, they have the robot go get the thing, send it out, it's all working fine, no human intervention is required. But if there's any failure in the real world business process, then you can have human operators intervene with it, and then when they've readjusted it 
they can go back into the state of the process in the engine and say, okay, that has now been shipped, and then the thing kicks off again, and then the machines just take care of all of the rest. And so I have a, uh, a demo in here called Cyber Monday, which is you know that big shopping kind of day that happens after Black Friday in the States. And what this one does is it does 1,000 orders 10 milliseconds apart. So it's going to order 10,000. I better turn the shipping on, otherwise it's going to raise a lot of incidents. Yeah. Uh, NPM run ships. OK, it's starting to ship. And then I start this thing off. So this is like lots of people ordering stuff. They're ordering one every 10 milliseconds, 1,000 of them. And then it, you can see it's just flowing through the system. Those microservices are you know, picking up all those orders. And what you can do is you can scale your workers uh, independently of the engine itself. So you can just start more workers on different nodes in Kubernetes. So we designed it to work in Kubernetes for massive scalability. And then if I go into my dashboard, I can see that there are 906 currently running business processes orders. Running instances. Uh, go back to the dashboard here. I'll make this even bigger so you can see it that down. That out of the way. Make this bigger. So if you have a look at it, you can see that, can you guys see those numbers? Yeah. There's like 44 in collect payment, and there's 253 in ship items. So I can see by looking at this that in my microservices system that's running, there's like back pressure happening at that one particular point. So what I would now do is I would start more instances of the shipping workers so that I could you know, equalize the pressure because the, the, the flow through your system is going to have like different impedances and run at different rates. And you want to know, know how should I scale the different services in my system. So you get that kind of visualization for free uh, by using BPMN for this. And I'll just show you another couple of BPMN diagrams just to finish. This one here is exploding kittens. So um, some of the guys who work on ZB, they had a hack day last week in Germany, and they built exploding kittens as a BPMN diagram. So this actually plays the game exploding kittens. And then the next thing that we want to do is um, make pluggable AI for the players. At the moment, the, the, it just, the workers like randomly play cards. They understand how to nope and to yup uh, plays. But we're going to make pluggable AI so that we can put different um, you know, intelligences in and play them against each other. And this BPMN diagram here is, this is um, from MagicCraft. So it's like Kartik mentioned in my project for teaching kids how to code in Minecraft. Whenever a player joins a Minecraft server, I kick off this business process here. And this handles like connecting their MagicCraft account to their Minecraft account and then synchronizing their code from their GitHub account onto the Minecraft server. And when I built this and then spec'd it all out like this, I was looking at it and I was like, oh, what happens if the user does this action and then quits at this point in the thing? And I could see by looking at it that I hadn't handled that case. And then I just had to draw another couple of boxes and connect them and it all automatically worked. And finally, I'll show you this is the REST server logic. So I showed you the simple REST server, and then I explained that there were like dealing with cases like if the broker is not available, or if it's under so much like workload that it doesn't respond in time for the REST response to finish. Now, implemented in code, if I go into my REST server and look in the index, that code is actually pretty kind of complex, and it's very difficult to reason about. It's like, um, you know, it's the difference between node red and just like writing tons of code and trying to trace the execution of the code in your head and did I handle all of the edge cases and everything. So what I did is I sat down and drew it out as the BPMN diagram for the REST server logic. And that's actually how it works, as like a state machine. And doing this is a, it's a great kind of exercise for making sure that you covered everything either before or after you do the design. But imagine if you could just take that state machine design document and then deploy it into the engine and then it would actually just work exactly as you had specified it and that's what using uh, a workflow management engine makes possible 
design documents that are executable, that can be shared between people, and are the actual runtime behavior of the system and can be visually inspected while it's running. Um, so yeah, here's my summary for this talk. It's like we've got to separate concerns. You know, we've got to se separate state and logic. We've got to separate transactional state from like global system state, and we also have to separate orchestration or choreographing uh, how pieces fit together from the actual implementation of the pieces. And you know, this BPMN and, and a work using a workflow engine is great for a microservices architecture. If you want to try it out, you can uh, npm install the ZB node library that I wrote and docker pull the Kamunda ZB um, image to, to try it out. And so I'll p post the link, I guess, somewhere. Um, okay, with all the links to the code and the, the documentation for the example that I showed you today. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That's very